Now, here's another comparison. Matthew gathers what Luke scatters. Matthew gathers what Luke scatters. Now, I want to just take an example from the Sermon on the Mount. I don't want to make a big deal of this. This is, uh, uh, to be honest, a pretty boring thing, but it just, it's just interesting. And so I want to just put these up here and just basically show you um, what happens here. Okay, so you've got the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew. It's all in chapters 5 to 7. So you've got, you know, you are the salt of the world. The salt's bad, then you throw it out. The salt is found in Luke chapter 14, verse 34, but it's found in Matthew chapter 5. You've got your candle. Uh, let your light shine before men. Don't hide your candle under a bushel. No, you know, you don't put a candle under a bushel. You put it on a lampstand so it can shine. The candle under bushel thing happens in Luke chapter 8. So you see that in Luke, Luke's got the salt in chapter 14 and the candle in chapter 8, separated by six chapters there. Whereas Matthew, they're, they're right back to back. The salt and the candle are right back to each other. The light of the body is in the eye. In Luke, that's in chapter 11. In Matthew, it's in the same Sermon on the Mount, chapter 6 in the Sermon on the Mount, the light of the body is the eye. But notice again, Luke, chapter 14, chapter 8, chapter 11. In totally different chapters even, these things are scattered. Ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find. Matthew chapter 7. Again, part of the Sermon on the Mount. In the book of Luke, that's in chapter 11, verse 9. Again, separated from any kind of context of that one discourse, and it's scattered about. And so you can see these things are scattered. One thing I should say at this point, too, it should be clear, um, did Jesus ever preach the same sermon more than one time? Uh, when I was younger, I was uh, taught at a Bible college in Bristol, Tennessee, and uh, when I was down there, uh, I was a, a circuit-riding preacher. And so every Sunday, I would preach at like a different church. And so I had like five churches, and then I would preach. And by the way, would I preach the same sermon at, at different churches? So I would go from one church to the next church and preach the same sermon five times then. So it was really kind of nice. You'd get up with the sermon once, and you could preach it five times. My wife, who traveled with me, um, she said the first time it was absolutely terrible. Uh, I love my wife. She's honest with me. And so I take that uh, cum grana solace, as they say. But anyways, my wife said, first time, bad things. I'm not the best preacher in the world, that's for sure. So I preached the first sermon. She said it needed work. Second time, it was much better. Third time, she said, the third time you preached it, you were on a roll. That was your best, and it was really good. The fourth time and the fifth time, she said, by the time you hit the fifth time, she said, I could tell you were bored with your own sermon. And so what I'm saying is, now Jesus wouldn't get bored with his own sermons, but, but is it very likely that Jesus, as he moved from place to place, said the same thing more than once and said it in different contexts and stuff. So you've got to be careful uh, when you know, you're quoting the salt, uh, you know, this or that, and the, the light under a candle, under a bushel and things. Jesus may have said that in, in many different contexts. And so you've got to be careful. Um, Luke may be recording it from one context, Matthew from another. So you just have to chill out on some of those details and not get you know, too um, obsessive compulsive about everything's got to be through the same lens. No, it doesn't have to be. If everything were through the same lens, no, the Gospels come with different lenses. So, But anyways, the point here is that Matthew gathers up what Luke scatters. Luke has scattered things. Matthew is methodical. Matthew is methodical. He gathers things up. What does that say about the, the narrative and chronology? Is it possible the writer is not writing an exact chronology according to time? Does a writer always have to develop his story according to time? No, time is just one factor. It may be that the writer is developing a theme, and maybe he's got a theme going, and so the theme takes priority over the chronology. And so if you've ever been around people who tell stories, you'll know sometimes the chronology gets out of order, not because, but it's because the point he's trying to make is something else. And so the point will be to make the point, not to necessarily establish the chronology. So you've got to ask, what is the function and purpose of the, of the story? Now, this is interesting, I think. I uh, read an article, I think it was by Stanley Porter in Vipsack, um, about uh, James, comparing James and Matthew. Now, the book of James is, is the end of the Bible there in the New Testament. And the book of James, by the way, is not written off. Uh, people, remember James and John, the sons of Zebedee? They were fishermen. Jesus called James and John. 
Uh, Peter, James, and John often went with Jesus when it was special, uh, alone to the Mount of Transfiguration or to the healing of the, of the dead girl. And so basically they invited Peter, James, and John. James, the brother of John, died early in the church, probably around 44 AD. So James, is the brother of John, is one of the first martyrs. So he is dead. James is dead, dead, before you know, Matthew gets written, before Mark gets written. James is dead before any of the kind of writing down of stuff happens. He's an early martyr. James, one of the first martyrs, okay? This is James, it turns out, probably the brother of Jesus. This is James, probably the brother of Jesus. And in Matthew and other places, it mentions that Jesus had, says your mother and your brothers are here, James and Joseph, and you know they're here to come and get you and stuff. Some of his brothers thought he was crazy for a while. But anyways, apparently James accepted Christ and, and things. And so James is going to write as the brother of Jesus. And so it's very interesting. James would have heard the teachings of Jesus as his brother, and so James then writes some things. And what's interesting is they're very similar to the book of Matthew. There's this overlap between the book of James and the book of Matthew. And so you would think that they're both, by the way, James is probably also written in a Jewish context kind of thing. And so it's just uh, interesting here. James says, blessed is the man who perseveres under trial. Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial. Well, that's interesting because Matthew says, blessed are those who have been persecuted for righteousness sake. So you can see, they're not exactly word for word, but you can see that there's, there's similarities there. And that's, uh, that's interesting. Here's another one, and this one gets a little closer. James says, if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks his, at his natural face in the mirror. Okay? So this contrast between the hearer of the word and the doer. Matthew chapter 7 Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them, this contrast between hearing the words and doing, will be like a foolish man who's built his house upon the sand. The wise man built his house upon the rock. The foolish man built his house upon the sand. What is the difference between the wise man and foolish man? The foolish man hears the words of Jesus, but then does not act on them. Hears the words of Jesus, but does not act on them. And so you get the same contrast between the words and the works between Matthew and James. Here's one that's probably the most stunning of them. James 5.12. But above all, my brethren, do not swear, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or with any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no, no, so that you may not fall under judgment. That's James. Listen to what Matthew says. But I say to you, this is, G, this is Jesus talking, make no oath at all, but let your statement be yes, yes, or no, no. And so you get this yes, yes, no, no, don't swear, this kind of thing. Uh, don't take an oath, don't swear, and things. Very, very parallel between James and Matthew. And so it just it's interesting, these parallels between you know, uh, Mark, G, Matthew collapsing, uh, the miracles of Mark, expanding the words that Jesus said. Luke gathering what Luke scatters. And here with James, paralleling a lot of the things James and Matthew paralleling many of the sayings of Jesus.